Well, I'd like to welcome everyone as uh, we do another video service. And it looks like now we'll be doing the social distancing uh, until the end of May. So our prayer is, of course, is that uh, God would bring healing to the land and uh, we would be able to begin to open things up. And our prayer is uh, first Sunday of June, uh, we can hope we can come and worship and celebrate together. Uh, but again, until that time takes place, I will continue to bring you a weekly uh, message, uh, you know, on topics, maybe various topics. But the last time we were together, last week's message, I mentioned that we would take a look at biblical prophecy. And what I want to do is I want people to see that biblical prophecy sometimes is misunderstood. And uh, you'll see people making fun of things when we talk about the Antichrist, Mark of the Beast, and some of these things. And I've uh, seen things online that mock the things of Christ. And that doesn't surprise me, obviously, because, you know, the people aren't Christians. They don't understand what the Bible teaches. But what I'd like to do is I would like to take you on a little bit of a journey for the next few weeks to see how come we're going through what we're going through. And one of the things that I have noticed uh, is that people who don't understand the Bible and doesn't understand God or God's purposes are blaming God for the coronavirus. And the thing is, is that God didn't create this virus. And what I want to do is I want to take you back. We're going to really begin back in Genesis so that people can understand what, why we are in the world we're in and what is really happening. But with those things said, there's a couple things that I want to do point out to you. One of the things that I want you to see is that the world does not evolve around where you and I are living at. In other words, as people living in northern Illinois, for example, we kind of think the whole world is like us. And that's not true. Uh, matter of fact, the United States is different, all just in the different states. You go to New York, the way they view things is different than how they do in California, Florida, and you get the picture. And I've had the privilege of doing some missions trips over the last few years. And in doing so, I've had the privilege of meeting people from different cultures and different places around the world. And in doing so, I realized that, you know, the center of the world is not America. Uh, you know, it's a very important part of the world, but it is not the center of the world. So the things that I'm going to show to you aren't just for the United States. We need to look at things from a global perspective. What is happening around the world? And then pulling it all together as we look at biblical prophecies. Because there are places around the world that are experiencing different problems than we're experiencing. Plus, on top of that, uh, the virus that is spreading, uh, you know, across the United States and around the world uh, as well. And so I want you to be able to see that. Uh, but the one I want you to do is I want you to see that the what is taking place, some of these things that are happening right now, actually have been prophesied over 2,000 years ago. And I'm just going to touch on these, and then we're going to take a look at a few other things. And then as I touch on them, we'll expand on them in later in later messages. In Matthew chapter 24, and beginning at verse 4, the disciples had come to Jesus and said, you know, Lord, what are the signs of the last days? You know, what, what can we see? What can we look to to realize that things are winding down and that Christ would be returning? So they asked Jesus this, and Jesus' response to them in verse 4 is number one. Take heed that no one deceives you. And so this is very, very important because what's happening in churches, you know, there are false teachers, false prophets, false pastors, false messages, people promoting things that are not biblically correct. And there are people that are following those things. And one of the things that I tell the people of our congregation here is that you have to read the Bible for yourself. You have to understand God's word. And what makes people shallow, what makes Christians shallow, is that they come to church on Sunday night, they come to church on Wednesday night, Saturday night, whenever you have church, whatever it may be, and they just listen to what comes from the pulpit. And what comes from the pulpit 
isn't always biblical. It can be opinion. It can be something to deal with, you know, community and social issues. And they're taking time when they really need to be preaching God's word. Now, not that the community isn't important, not that social is, issues aren't important. It's okay to do that once in a while. We've done that here. But as pastors, our job is to take this gospel and to present it in a truthful manner so that people understand the truth about the word of God. And we'll get into many things later on, but there are people who are told that, you know, they don't want the truth. And so we're told later on, and Timothy saying, you know, churches, people, followers will bring teachers uh, who will just teach the good stuff, you know, only the good things that they want to hear. And they don't want the truth about God and God's word. So it's important that you understand that this has been going on. And honestly, it's been going on for 2000 years because you go back and look at first and second Corinthians, other things that's going on in the Gospels you know, in the New Testament. And when you look at all those things, uh, you realize that there were false prophets, false teachers, all that started, you know, immediately almost after the death of Jesus Christ. So, you know, this is going to take place, but I want you to see verse five. For many will come in my name, okay, saying I am the Christ, which I just shared with you, and will deceive many. And here's six. It says there'll be wars and rumors of wars. And I have looked and found out how many conflicts were going on around the world before the coronavirus hit. There's multiple conflicts and wars taking place. I also want you to see this too. He says, now see that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. He said, these things are gonna happen. And he says, church, Christians, followers, you know what? You're gonna see this coming to pass. Verse seven. Nation will rise against nation. You know, all you got to do is watch the news and realize this is true. You know, this nation is trying to overthrow that nation, and, and there's just wars and nations and problems and all these things taking place. And so we see these things as well. It says, and there will be famines, and I will give you places in the world that right now are experiencing famine. Others are getting too much rain. You know, that's all part of it. Pestilence. Interesting, the word pestilence here in the Greek is not only the meaning for like bugs, locusts, and that type of a thing, but this other meaning means diseases. And it's not just the virus we're experiencing now, but there are diseases that go on around the world that he says, this is going to be happening. This is, this is part of the fall of mankind, and we'll talk about that. And earthquakes in various places. And uh, it was interesting. I was on a missions trip a few weeks ago, just weeks as this was taking place with the virus. And while they were bringing up the news about the virus, while I was watching what channel I could watch, it was in English where I was, um, they talked about an earthquake in Idaho and in Utah and how many they've had. And, and divers places simply means various places if you're using the uh, King James uh, version of the Bible. I use the new King James. And it says, now all of these things are simply what? The beginning of sorrows. And he says, so here are the signs. Here are the things that you can look at that are going to let you know that the return of Christ, that the end is coming near. Now, no one can predict when Jesus is coming back. As a matter of fact, if you flip over in your Bibles, and in that same 24th chapter of Matthew, in verse 20, 36, it says, but of that day and hour, no one knows. No, not even the angels of heaven, but the Father only. So here's another thing, Christian church. If you are getting information off the internet, which God, I, it's amazing to me, you know, because it's on the internet, people believe it's true. And uh, that's a whole nother issue. But if you're getting issue, you know, things from the internet, issues and problems from the internet, people saying, check this out, look at this, read this article, whatever, really believe about half of it, you know, right? And make sure that you research it. And there's people predicting the end of the world and giving out dates and that type of thing. And I'm going to tell you right now, if somebody's telling you they know when Jesus is coming back, they are a liar. Nobody knows. Only God knows. Jesus says, I don't even know. So I'm going to tell you, if Jesus doesn't know, some man somewhere on this planet surely does not know. And what I'd like to do is take a few minutes. So I've been pastoring 
uh, for over 30 years now. And uh, it's been interesting because in the church, there are always new fads that come through. You know, something's new that's going on. You got people blowing shofars, which is a ram's horn that the Hebrews would use for opening worship. They got them blowing in the churches. Uh, and then there's people predicting the end of the world. And I, of course, as always, I've had people upset with me when I say, yeah, but that guy doesn't know when Jesus is coming back. Well, yeah, but he wrote a book and he did the math and he knows. He says, no, he doesn't know. He can't know. Jesus says no one knows. And yet people get convinced that somebody came up with some mathematical equation that these are when Jesus is coming back. So let me share just a couple of them with you uh, this morning uh, as well. All right. So back in 1988, this little booklet here came out called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Take Place in 88. Okay. Well, obviously it did not. And the guy that wrote this realized that it did not. So what did he do? Oh, I made a mathematical error. I know what it is. It's 1989. Yeah, okay, right. Never happened, okay? Here's another one. The world is going to be shaken. And it will be, but these guys don't know that. Here's the news from Israel. The 144,000 sealed. Now, that is true. There's a passage in Scripture about the 144,000 sealed of God, which are Jewish people who are followers of Christ. But again, this guy is setting dates, doesn't know who they are, doesn't know the names, and all these things that people think that they know or pretend that they know. Uh, and here's another one. The, the, who can resist? Uh, you know, the devil unmasked. Okay, and here's another one. When is Jesus coming back? Preparing for the end. Oh, Y2K, K. all right? Everybody remembers Y2K? The whole world is going to fall apart. Um, right, okay? But yet people people did all this. And here's another good one. Judgment Day is near in the autumn of 1992. Jesus is coming again. All right. They don't know. And the thing is, is that our goal as Christians is to be ready when he comes. The Bible clearly tells us that he is going to come when we least expect it. And so I want to make sure that you understand that. So there's a lot of talk about it. And there are signs right now that I'll show you that are biblical, just like what I just read to you. But I don't know when Jesus is coming back. It could be tonight. It could be next week. It could be 20 years from now. I don't know. But the Bible says, you know what? There'll be signs. There's things that you're going to be able to see so that you know that the end is getting near. And I've read to you those things as well as we've looked at them. And a couple of other things that I want to share with you about that as well. So not only then was that 2,000 years ago, uh, but this whole thing now about tracking people. All right. Uh, if you've been watching the news and I've jotted it down and I've got more details when I actually really get into this. But we've seen where China is doing that already with the virus, using that as an excuse to track people. It's been talked about here in the United States. Uh, you know, if, if you don't want to, uh, uh, you know, get tracked or if you don't want to take the vaccine, if they come up with one, then we need to know where you're at, where you've been. So China is tracking people. Uh, and it's on their cell phone. And you know your cell phone, they know everything you do. They know go everywhere you're going to go. Uh, they know your location. How many times have you been to a restaurant? And you've left the restaurant and says, hey, how did you like your meal at such and such a place? They found you. They know where you are. You know, so, so they know exactly what's going on. And so the idea then is, is at some point in time is to track people. Uh, and they give you a barcode. And the barcode, the one in China, uh, says, well, uh, if you've been out of the country in the last 14 days, it'll tell them that. And it also will tell them whether you're a health risk or not and whether you're allowed into an establishment or in a restaurant. So they're doing that. And I jotted some notes down this morning from a couple of other countries. South Korea is looking at using a wristband. And the wristband is given to the people who ignore the quarantine. So they're going to mark them. You know, so... so you know, and, and Revelation, Revelation chapter 13, verses 15 through 18, clearly tells us that in the, about the middle of the book of Revelation, when the, the tribulation period, all right, what is going to happen, he says the, the beast, the Antichrist, he will rise up and he will cause all men, great and small, rich or poor, 
male or female, king or queen, makes no difference who they are. No human being on this planet, when the Antichrist comes into play, is going to be special or above anybody else. And you go back and read those passages of Scripture, it says that he will cause them to take a mark and is the mark of man. And the Greek in man is 666. That's where we get that. So that is a Greek, you know, Greek meaning there. He says, we'll cause them to take the mark and it will be their hand or their forehead. And I've got, when we get closer to it, I have a printout of a factory uh, in uh, actually up in Wisconsin who actually put a chip in the hand of about half of their employees. And it's about the size of a rice chip and it goes, or a piece of rice, and it goes into their hand, and uh, they were able to open up elevator doors, they were able to clock in, they were able to use vending machines, and they didn't, you know, you don't lose it. They keep track of you. They know your bank account. They know your health history. And so they've tested this, and this was tested, and I'll show you the, I got the front page of the article. This was just about a year and a half ago. And uh, and so they're, they're testing these things. Again, what event will take place? that will have all of this stuff go into play, I have no idea. See, I believe that it's a financial or economic collapse uh, that will cause people to, governors, prin uh, uh, princes and kings and queens, uh, you know, uh, presidents of countries. You know, you have to look at it in a way of realizing what event, what catastrophe is going to take place to cause every nation in the world to turn their currency, their power, their sovereignty, and their authority over to just one being. And so, again, it could be 20 years from now. I hope so. But it could be any time. But you're seeing the little bits and pieces of it starting to emerge they're starting to talk about it. Uh, you know, they're looking at one world currency because now, you know, because of the virus, they don't want cash because the virus might be on the cash. Or, well, you know, maybe we need to go to all digital. So all of this stuff is being talked about, but I'm going to tell you, it may be new to some of you, but if you are a Christian and you're in a Bible-believing church and you've studied the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel and other things, and you look at this and you go, wow, yeah, this it's unfolding and we're watching it. Uh, unfold. And so we have these things then that we are going to look at. And then uh, before we get into the Genesis, in the first John chapter four, verses four through one, one th first chapter four, verses one through four, um, John is writing and, and he says, the spirit of the Antichrist, he says, you've heard of it, but he says, it's present now. And the spirit of the Antichrist is a lot of the stuff that I just gave to you, you know, one world order, bringing people together, the Roman Empire being revised, which you see in the book of Daniel, and I'll bring some of those things up as well. It's just this attitude against Christ, against Christianity. Uh, so we're going to see that unfold, you know, as this goes on here uh, in the last days. What I want to do is I want to take you into Genesis, and I've got a few notes here that I want to share with you this morning. And it really is, you need to understand that this is not God's fault. He did not cause this. And that really God made mankind, human beings, Adam and Eve, because he loves man. And he wanted to have a relationship with man. And that's how it started. And then it became tainted because of the fall and the disobedience of Adam and Eve. So let me highlight a few things for you in here as we take a look at this. And, and I'm sure, and I'm going to mention, probably won't get that far today, but I'll mention about, you know, people that are evolutionists and, you know, some great books to read that, you know, again, science that, you know, really disproves evolution. Uh, and that's the other thing, just to mention, uh, there is science on, everybody throws out the word, yeah, but the science. You know, you'll see that about climate change. They'll say, yeah, but the science. But there's science that says that their science is wrong. Uh, evolution, 
It's the science. Well, now there's science that says that their way of thinking is wrong. I mean, you know, people will throw out the word of science as an authority. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily make it so because there's two sides to everything. And obviously those issues have never been settled and they probably never will get settled, uh, you know, just because people have the choice to be on either side of those issues. But, you know, again, it's the science. So that's a great thing. And I'll, and I'll mention the book here uh, probably at the end of this or sometime uh, next week when we get farther into this. So anyway, in Genesis chapter 1, verses uh, 126 through 31, we are told that God said, let us make man in our own image. Now the word us there is Elohim in the Hebrew. Uh, and that simply means gods or plural more than one. So for us, you know, we believe it's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And our first reference to the Trinity uh, that early in that passage of Scripture. And it says, let us make man in our own image. And I think it's interesting because the word make is to make something out of nothing. You know, something that was not there before now is. And he says, we're going to make that. And it even goes farther in Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. It says that God formed man from the dust of the ground. Now, the Hebrew here means a couple of things. The first thing that it means is this. Uh, it means to fashion something as a potter, to fashion something as a potter. So when God is, was making mankind, it wasn't some throw some dirt together, slap some water on it, form some clay and away we go. And you know, here comes man. Uh, the idea here clearly is that a potter does not make anything unless he has something in mind, which is the second meaning to this word. In other words, God did not make man without having a plan for him. He did not make man haphazardly. He created man and he had a plan in mind. And one of the things that you'll hear from evolution is that there is no plan. There is no creator. You know, you and I, a billion years ago, you know, crawled out of some swamp and started forming legs after a million years. And, and you, most of you know the story. You know, the problem is, is who made the swamp? Who made the microbes? Where did they come from? You know, who created those things? I mean, again, you know, there's, there's nothing there to stand on uh, as far as solid evidence. But, you know, the world's going to believe what the world's going to believe. Christians are going to believe what we're going to believe. And again, like always, the two will never come together. So the idea then is to have something in mind. So when God formed man, it was because he had something in mind and he wanted to have a relationship with him. See, people need to understand this. God's not out after you. God doesn't hate you. God loves you. Christ died for you on the cross. Sort of tells us that we just celebrated Easter. And there's this idea that somehow God hates mankind, and he does not. He formed us and made us because he wanted a relationship with us and because he loves us. That's why we were made. God wanted us to exist. He chose for us to be who we are, and he did it on purpose. And he wants to have that relationship with you. But the problem was, is when Adam and Eve failed, the relationship they had with God was severed. Sin severs the relationship. And so what happens then is that in the Old Testament, you know, because the Jewish people were chosen by God to be his people, how could they come to God? Well, they had to do sacrifices. And so that's what they did. But we see in Easter, if you remember your Easter messages and stories, which we just had, you know, we are clearly showing that, you know, Jesus became our sacrifice. And the blood of Jesus Christ is what cleanses us from our sins and from our unrighteousness. And so we see where God's plan is in place. We see where God's plan is unfolding. And all the stuff that you see now is all part of God's in control of this. He's not causing it. Because when Adam and Eve fell, what entered into the world was sin. And sin is pain, heartache, sorrow, disease, brokenness, addictions. All of that stuff came into this world because of their failure. And I'll get into it more next week. But God did not cause it. God did not cause this. This is mankind's doing, mankind's fallen nature. Whether it's an experiment that went wild in China or, or you know, bat soup or 
you know, who knows, we've got all kinds of rumors and things going around, whatever it is, God didn't do it. As a matter of fact, God is going to use this, I believe, to hopefully speak to people's hearts, bring revival to America and around the world and let you realize there is a bigger picture going on here than what uh, we see. And again, we'll get into that. Well, my half hour is almost up already, and uh, we will pick it up uh, next week. And I'll finish going through my notes here concerning Adam and Eve, and then we'll get into some of the other things that I have mentioned. So if you are a believer, you know, keep praying. Keep praying for God to heal us, heal the land, uh, heal the world, you know, all of these things going on that's taking place. I know there's a lot of different views on things. There are some people that think the virus is a, a just a ploy for control for the governments to bring in, you know, socialism, you know, tracking, these kind of things. Could be, uh, you know, could be really happening. Uh, again, I think it's kind of somewhere in the middle. Uh, I'm sure there is a virus going around. Uh, that doesn't mean that governments won't take advantage of it to, uh, you know, play out what they want to see done. Um, again, we'll look at that more like next week. So pray, you know, pray for uh, the churches in America. Pray for revival. Pray that God will use this uh, to bring the churches together and stop being infighting, selfish, and how people are, human beings are, and to begin to preach the gospel and to let people know that Jesus loves them and died on the cross for them because that really is going to be the only answer. So let's pray. Lord, I, uh, I do come to you today, and uh, Lord, I do lift up not just the United States. I just lift up the leaders and people that you would give them wisdom. And I pray for healing of this land, Lord God. But I also know, Lord God, that you are able to take adversity. You are able to take struggles and battles and turn them to something positive. And so I pray for our nation. I pray for this globe, Lord God. There would be revival, that people would look up and see that you are our hope and that you are our redemption. So, Lord, I pray. And as people pray with me, Lord God, I pray that you'll touch them and strengthen them and encourage them. And uh, we lift all these families up to you for safety and protection in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, thank you for allowing me to come into your homes, our office, or wherever you may be. And uh, may God bless you.